David Bowie's The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars was both a cultural and a musical milestone. The outrageous outfits and gender-bending behavior of Ziggy Stardust, it was really an inspiration to so many, especially to those who didn't quite fit in. And when this album was released in June 1972, it really marked a musical turning point, leaving the hippie flower power era and stepping into the world of glam rock. Joining us to tell the story about the recording of the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars is the album's co-producer, Ken Scott. And Ken is a bit of a legend himself, I have to say. He started at a very young age, working at Abbey Road Studios, working his way up until he was actually doing some engineering for the Beatles and for George Martin, working on the White Album and also the Magical Mystery Tour. He also engineered uh, George Harrison, All Things Must Pass, and a bit on David Bowie's The Man Who Sold the World. And then he sat in the producer seat for the first time when recording David Bowie's Hunky Dory. So he's a real legend, and let's give him a warm round of applause to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank always. you. So Especially the questions at the end. That's the I always I like. love the questions at the end too, because I, I don't have to do anything. So it's, so it's great for me. Um, why don't you tell us how you first met David Bowie? I had been working at Abbey Road Studios. Uh, I decided to leave and went to work at a, uh, a ever-growing independent studio called Trident. And one of the first things that happened when I got there uh, was one Saturday, I believe it was, this artist came in, a young, fairly young kid, I guess, uh, and recorded something which became fairly well known. It was a song called Space Oddity, and the guy that came in to record it was one David Bowie. Now, I didn't engineer that. One of the managers of the studio engineered that, but then, because it sold, the record company, Mercury, wanted an album. So I, as well as another one of the engineers, Malcolm Toff, were put on to record the album. Then, when uh, it was time for his second album, well, I guess third album, really, uh, Man Who Sold the World, they started off recording that at an outside studio, came to Trident, and I did the overdubs and the mixing, mm -hmm. and carried on from there. And what did he, what kind of personality did he have? How did he, what kind of impression did he make on you at that time? Oh, he was great. I, I, I really enjoyed working with him. He, he, he was fun. He was a sweet person. Uh, he had a certain amount of talent, but he was never <laughs> going to make it. Never <laughs> in a million years. And so when was the next rendezvous? I believe it was to record a friend of his called Freddie Beretti, uh, which I think, it eventually, some of it eventually came out under the name Vinyl Corns, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Freddie was uh, interesting. We were petrified the, the day he came in to record because he was wearing the shortest hot pants we had ever seen in our <laughs> lives, and we were expecting anything could happen with those at any given time, and we were extremely worried about it, but luckily... Luckily, it went okay. In fact, Freddie Beretti, he was, a, he was a fashion designer, and I think his, it was A.K. Rudy Valentino, I think was his, his uh, other yeah, name. Yeah. yeah. And he, David wanted him to sing, and they tried, and it was, the results weren't uh, to his satisfaction, so Bowie ended up doing those songs. It was Hang On To Yourself, I believe, A Moon Age Daydream, which eventually were uh, recorded and made their Probably, way onto, yeah. the, onto the Ziggy Stardust album. But I think Freddie Breddy ended up designing some of Ziggy's he costumes. Did so he did have a role to play in Ziggy Stardust. Um, do you remember those recordings? Because I, I listened back, actually, to Hang On To Yourself. I have it with me, but we won't play it right now. A Moon Age Daydream. Is it a bootleg? No, they were actually, oh. I had the original bootleg. I had the original bootleg. I did have a bootleg from the 80s. But I, there was a box set called wow. Five Years, and they, they uh, one, one put those on sets. there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, Bowie's voice sounds so different. It sounds so frail and thin. It doesn't have that kind of full oh, voluptuousness. Oh, I couldn't have recorded that one. Yeah. It must have been someone else. Definitely, that must have been why. Yeah, it couldn't have been you then. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay. In any case, then you were brought on to be become a co-producer of Hunky Dory. How did that all come well, about? That, that happened during the Freddie Baretti sessions. Mm. Uh, I had realized I wanted to have more artistic say. There's a thing that engineers go through where you're sitting at the mixing console, you've got the producer by the side of you, and you have this feeling of something that would work musically. And you, you go to him, you know what would work under this guitar solo? A herd of trumpeting elephants. <laughs> the producer looks at you and he says, you think so, really? And I said, yeah, I think it would be really good. <laughs> so we bring in the herd of trumpeting elephants, we record them, send them back on their way, pay them their union views, of course. <laughs> uh, then if it worked, it was the producer's idea. If it didn't work, oh, it was only Ken's idea. I didn't think it would work anyway. You get fed up with that kind of thing after a while. So I wanted to be that person that could come up with the ideas and sink or swim by them. Mm -hmm. And during one of the many tea breaks on, on the Freddie Baretti sessions, uh, David and I were talking, and I happened to, to voice my thoughts. I wanted to do that. And he said, I've just signed a new management deal. They want to put me into the studio to record an album so that they can shop a deal. A record deal and I was going to produce it myself I don't know if I'm capable of doing it will you co-produce with me now I had as Colleen said I I am the luckiest or the most blessed person in this world because the way my life has gone has been absolutely astounding starting off the first the first session I'm ever assistant engineer on his side two of a hard day's night. <laughs> the first session I ever sit behind a mixing console not knowing what the hell I was doing was for Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> uh, and here I'd been thrown into fire on those ones. It, it's, yeah, I can't explain how it felt going into those. But here I was with this, this guy that I really liked. He was really nice. He obviously had a certain amount of talent, but no one was ever gonna really hear the album that much. So <laughs> I could learn my new gig, working with this mm. slightly talented artist. So of course <laughs> I said, yeah, I'd love to co-produce it with you. Then two weeks later, I guess, David, Angie, his wife, and his publisher, Bob Grace, came around my house with cassettes and started to play these demos. And I, it was probably the second song that, uh, we played that suddenly I realized here I go again this guy has far more talent than I ever realized and mm. people might actually get to hear this this record <laughs> that was hunky dory mm. and what was your impression of working on a full album with David Bowie co-producing with him because now you're really working you know together for an extended period of time on an entire project well I, I, when we went in I think we were both nervous because we were, we were attempting something that we hadn't, neither of us had done before. And a certain amount of trepidation there. But as, as we worked and things were working and it was sounding good, our confidence was growing so we could be bigger and better at, just within our own minds as we're going. So that part of it was amazing. Uh, David was very much, one of, one of David's incredible talents was, uh, picking a team to give him exactly what he wanted at any given time. Mm. And the, the, the team of Rono, Woody, Trevor, at this point it was, just, it was just them, David and myself, we knew what it was supposed to be. We didn't have to tell each other all the time. We just instinctively knew this is what's got to happen here, this is what's got to happen there. So it, it was astounding. There was no one telling us what to do. We were just doing it. And also you didn't have a record company breathing down your back. No, oh no. He, we didn't have he wasn't company. signed by that time, was he? You know, I, I'm not sure when he actually signed the record deal, to be honest. Uh, I know I know RCA were interested after Hunky Dory, but there was still there was still that thing of we're gonna do another album immediately afterwards, and it was just a few weeks after finishing Hunky Dory. That's incredible. Oh yeah. <laughs> because they even Insanity. exactly for you it must have been incredible. <laughs> But also when, you know, as the listener and as a Bowie fan, you look at those two albums and you see, oh, wow, look at this big dramatic change. I mean, there's a dramatic change with some of the music. I mean, I, I would say there's a lot more acoustic. Well, I guess I could think of Queen Bitch going to Suffragette okay. City. So maybe Precisely. there are there, there are a lot of likenesses, yeah. but maybe it's more with, of the image itself because all of a sudden you have this more pastoral Bowie on the, on the hunky-dory. Yep. Uh, back um, cover of the album cover and looking like Marlena Dietrich in a certain pose, long hair, 
Um, and, and then. Uh, exactly. And then, yeah, a whole <laughs> different Bowie. Yeah. Did you see, I mean, there was only a few weeks between recording both of these albums. First of all, was there any visual changes to David Bowie when he came back into the studio? There must have been some changes, but I, it, it's because they were so close together, it, it, it was like your kids growing up. Mm. You see them every day kind of thing. So you don't see the changes as much as other people that only see them every week or every month. And it was very much like that because we were together so much. There were changes, but I, they weren't as drastic to me as they were to people that saw him a month ago and then suddenly saw it. God, he's changed. His hair's completely... Mm. It, it, it just... It was one of those. No, I don't remember noticing that much. Was he in the press more at that time? Or is it still, were people still, does he still have a, a bit of a private life? Well, I think his private life, he, they, yeah, he used as much as possible. I remember yeah. when Hunky Dory came out, there was on the front page of, it was either the Daily Mirror or the Mail. It may have been the Sun, actually, thinking about it. But uh, the front page was you saw... Uh, someone with very long hair and someone with very short hair pushing a pram. And you instinctively thought the long hair was the female and the short hair was the male. Mm. Then they show exactly the same picture, but from the front, and you saw that the short hair was Angie and the long hair was, was David, and they were mm. pushing Duncan. I mean, so they're so ahead of their time. And I think Angie had a lot to do with that as well. Yeah. And you, you got on well with her, because there's a lot of horror stories about her, sadly, which I don't think is very fair in a sense, but... I, th you know. I think that a lot of that happened later. Yeah. Uh, she would drop by the studio every now and again, mm -hmm. and you knew she was there when she came. Mm -hmm. You knew it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I guess w one would classify her as the typical loudmouth yank. I don't know anything about loudmouth <laughs> yanks. Not, not as my wife, Cheryl. I know. Yeah, right. I, I know his wife very well. <laughs> we love to get together. You can hear us in the next room. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you... you knew she was around when she came, but luckily she wasn't around that much. But mm. we, when we got together outside <laughs> of the studio kind of thing, she was, she was great, she was fine. And I, I think that whether it was jealousy of, of his success, mm. whether it was jealousy of the other people that he, he spent time with, uh, I don't know. But yeah, she did get one hell of a yeah, uh, she did. reputation. And she seemed like she almost helped him with his image from what I understand oh, yeah, as well. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, we said he didn't look any different, really, uh, from not that going, that you remember. But how about, did he behave any, any differently? Not, not at that point. No. Other than when we started Ziggy, we already had the confidence that we had got through doing Hunky Dory. Uh, as I said, we started off a lot of trepidation, gained confidence, and then we came into Ziggy, and yeah, we knew what we were doing. We, and once again, it was that team we... we we knew what was needed. Right. Now, to, to the point of, uh, there, there was, the only thing that I was told by David going into this was uh, that it was going to be more rock and roll. He didn't think I'd like it. <laughs> and he wanted it more like, and I can never remember whether it was Iggy Pop or Velvet Underground. And the fact that I didn't know who either of them were at that point <laughs> didn't make much difference. But, uh, I did like it. He was wrong. Well, it's interesting, yeah. I mean, with the whole Velvet Underground, because you could hear that when he's talking about Andy Warhol, and that's you on uh, Andy who? Yeah. Warhol. And that's yeah. that's Ken that you can hear on the on the uh, <laughs> in the engineering room. That 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 was take one. We didn't actually use take one for the song, but we all yeah. liked that so much we had to edit it onto the beginning. <laughs> well, I mean. There's so much theatricality on this album, and that's more to do with the persona that he takes on as Ziggy Stardust. And uh, apparently, he didn't tell you what any inspiration was for the character, correct? Um, you have Davy Jones becomes David Bowie, becomes Ziggy Stardust on this album. And he, of course, studied with Lindsay Kemp, the mime artist, teacher, dancer, choreographer, and, and he was very interested in mime and theatricality himself, I, I of think, course. Excuse me, but you did leave off one other thing there, a gay that, icon. Yeah, which yeah. Which very That's important. true, yeah. Lindsay Kemp definitely was a gay icon as well. Um, but with Ziggy, it kind of, you know, the persona starts to take over him, uh, take him over as time goes on, but not in these early days. But there have been things that have been suggested that inspire, whether it was the legendary Stardust Cowboy, who was more of an outsider musician, who was also signed to RCA. 
there was also um, Vince Taylor, who Joe Strummer said really started British rock and roll, and who David Bowie ended up meeting when Vince Taylor was just kind of a shadow of himself. He had done too many drugs and ended up, I think, quite destitute. And Bowie bumps into him in 90, you know, much later. And uh, he's kind of half the man that he was before, or a quarter of the man. But also, the, some people suggest it could be Iggy Pop could be a little bit of a, a, an influence in there as well, because you know he had taken, he was a big fan of the, of the Stooges, and he ended up producing Iggy Pop and befriending yep. him as well. So there was a, a bunch of different people that may or may not have influenced the, the, the Ziggy yeah, Stardust the, the, character. The, the, the problem is that. Whatever you, whichever one you would say to David, he would agree that that's what it was. Mm. It, it's there, there's a track on Hunky Dory, very briefly, called the Bewley Brothers. Mm. Now that was recorded. I think it was the last song we recorded. We were just finishing up recording. David came in one morning and said, "I got a new song." Well, morning, lunchtime, kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've got this new song. I've just written it. We've got to record it. I said, "Great, okay, we'll do it." He said, "But don't take any notice of the lyrics." And I said, "Okay, why not?" And he said, because I wrote it specifically for the American market, and it doesn't mean anything, but I know that they're going to read things into it. <laughs> now, remember, this was the time, this was the era of Paul is Dead, when American DJs were finding every little thing they could find to uh, say that Paul McCartney is dead, and that's a stand-in, that it's not really him. So it was all around that time. And I know with David, I've heard... 10, 15, 20 different stories of what the Bewley Brothers is all about, and David would have agreed with every single one of them. Oh, that's interesting. I remember Sheila Ravenscroft telling me a story about John Peel, who was very close to John Lennon, and John Lennon had a new album out, and he was talking to John Peel on the phone, and John Lennon says to John Peel, well, I need to hang up now, I need to read the papers, uh, there's reviews of my album coming out, I need to find what, out, what my album's all about. <laughs> so, yep. similar, similar kind of thing. Yep. So he told you it was going to be more rock and roll. Now, did he tell you there was any concept behind the album at all? Because a lot nope. of these songs have been kicking around for a while, hadn't they? They had. And mm. if you think about it logically, first off, it ain't easy. Mm. That was left over from the recording of Hunky Dory. So we just we had this spare track. We thought we'd throw it in there. Mm. Then the mainstay of the whole story is of the man coming from up there somewhere is the track Starman. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the last thing recorded for Ziggy, and the reason it was the last track was it was never meant to be on the album. In place of that, we had a cover of Chuck Berry's Round and Round. Yeah, that, was, oh. that was in place of it, and oh. the album was sent into RCA, mm -hmm. and they said, the album's great, but ah, we don't hear a single. Can you go in and record a single? Yeah, right, if everyone could write a hit just like that. But of course, David could. Yeah. So he goes away, comes back in with Starman, we record it and put it in place of Round and Round. And then suddenly, the whole album is a concept album. So did he have any idea that, 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 that this was going to revolve around a character? Well, it doesn't, every single song doesn't revolve around this no. character. But yet, you can piece it together in a way that Absolutely. it does. Absolutely. You can piece together Paul is dead if you take all of the individual yeah. pieces. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, Sergeant Pepper was, again, it yeah. wasn't a concept album. Yeah. It was very much, a, you know, it wasn't but, made to be a concept until the very end. Yeah. We thought, oh, yeah. here's a band that can tour for us so we don't have to tour. And, yeah. you know, they put on the reprise at the, at the end as well. So, well, let's go into some specific songs. And I wanted to speak about the first song, Five Years, which is such a beautiful song. And... Could you tell us what it was like working with David Bowie as a vocalist? Mm -hmm. I said earlier on that one of David's greatest talents was his ability to put together a team. Well, his greatest talent was his ability to perform in the studio. Uh, I co-produced four albums with him, and 90 to 95% of the vocals that we did on those albums was one take, the first take from beginning to end. I would run a bit of the tape just to get a level, get the sound on him. I'd go back, I'd hit record. And what he did that one time through is what you still hear today. Mm -hmm. I have never come across another artist that can do that. They'd have to punch in or something. And remember, this is before auto-tune. This is before being able to copy and paste and move things around and all that kind of thing. This was 
straight from here, straight from the soul, from his heart. Five years, you mentioned. By the end of that, he was bawling his eyes out. There are tears pouring down his face. He was so emotional about that song and performing it. He was astounding. Was, do you think that was a personal kind of feeling of emotion or was it a theatrical display? I, 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 probably a combination of both. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it was genuine, so, but... Uh, I, No, I, th I think there was a certain amount of theatricality. The, but the, the problem is that when, when you're mixing a song, y you want to get the power of the whole thing across, especially when there's as much going on as there is at the end of, of five years. So I mixed it to get the full power across as much as possible. And some of the nuances from David get lost. What I'll quite often do in talks, we can't, with, with this this particular occasion, but I'll quite often, I've got a, a mix that I did where, it, just of the end, where it's the original record, I fade that out to just uh, acoustic guitar, backing vocals and David's vocal. And I've had members of the audience in tears when they, they hear how he's actually performing it. Yeah. And the problem is it wouldn't be allowed today. It'd be go back in or auto-tune it or move it around because it's not perfect. None of his vocals... They're not all in pitch. They're not all in time. But, God, they feel amazing. And, and to me, that's what makes a, a good vocal performance. It's not whether every little nuance is in tune. It's, that's robotic. And I suppose, since you're the one who's responsible for the technical side of the recording as well, that you are not able to kind of immerse yourself into the actual, like being an audience member watching this private mm -hmm. performance. Did you ever oh, yeah. succumb to that? No, you can't. You, when it's that easy, it, it's if, if you're having to listen out to everything, trying to find mistakes, trying to find areas that you're going to have to go back and patch up, then yes, it becomes more technical. But I'd learned from, from Bowie that just sit back and enjoy it. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Now, one take wonder. Yeah. Was he impatient in the studio? Did he want to get things done quickly? Is well, that part of the reason, do you think? Well, yeah. When, when you're as good as he is, you want everyone to be that quick as well. Mm. You, you get bored. And like Woody and Trevor have always said that uh, they, they were nervous because if they took too many takes, they knew David would turn around and say, yeah, it's not working. Let's move on to the next song. So that, which... I feel is great because they're always on the edge of their seat and it gives a nervousness, it gives a humanness to it. Well, I've got to get this right. I've got to, they, they plow into it that much more mm. because of it. And uh, it all adds, adds to it. And was he very professional working in the studio? Did he keep regular hours or was like, you know, some, some people recording in the late 1960s, early 1970s and late 1970s had full on parties in the studio. What, what, what was it like? working with David in Trident? It, it was, we had a lot of fun, but it was professional. We only had two weeks to record an album. Wow. Uh, all of the albums at that point were like two weeks. You had, uh, the artist's contracts were that they had to come out with an album every six months. Wow. So that includes touring, writing, recording, everything in six months. And um, I believe that Hunky Dory came out after you recorded this album as well, so he yes. didn't even know how it was going right. to do. Well, and Hunky Dory died. You know? It wasn't popular when it first when it came out. So it was really Ziggy that made it popular, that reinvigorated it, it sales. Was, it was Top of the Pops that did it. Right. Well, let's Without talk about that in a moment, too. Uh, let's go on to some other specific songs. Moon Age Daydream. Can you tell us a bit about the recording of that song? David always considered himself like a, a chef. He'd take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Or oh, maybe a bit more of that and put it in and mix it all up and it would come out his, his own. Well, one very basic thing that he, he didn't mix too much else with it was the solo on Moon Age Daydream. There was uh, a song, uh, a hit record by uh, an American band called the Hollywood Argyles. And I can't remember the name of the single. It was Alley Oop. Alley Oop, that yeah. was it. Yes, thank yeah. you. And the B-side was, sh it was S-H-O apostrophe, so show, know a lot about love. Mm -hmm. And... Through the majority of it, there was this line played, which was played by a baritone sax and a flute. And David loved that sound. 
So we had to use that kind of sound for the solo on Moon Age Daydream, and it, it was it was a Barry, and uh, but we, it was a recorder because mm -hmm. no one could play the flute, but mm -hmm. David could play recorder. <laughs> and how about Suffragette City with that great sax solo? Oh, well, <laughs> I I have this uh, the saying about how David would agree that. 15, 20 different versions of Beaulieu Brothers. I have this recording of a, a, an American radio show that he did where they're playing Ziggy. It must have been the 30th anniversary or something like that. And they're playing it. And af after Suffragette City, the DJ says, and there's David playing those blaring baritone saxes. And David agreed with him. It's not saxes, it's an ARP synthesizer that we decided to throw on at the last minute because we knew it was lacking something. So I sent the, my assistant engineer upstairs to bring this synth down. We set it up, I got a sound on it, Rono played it. Now it's suddenly blaring baritone saxes. <laughs> now it's interesting you were talking about the Hollywood Argyles before. Did he bring in different songs? Uh, because you know he said it was, he was a bit like a magpie in terms of, oh, I like the sound of that, I like no. the sound of that. Also, I think in terms of styles of music, you can hear so many different styles of music that he also helped pioneer as well throughout his career. Um, but did he bring in any other types of songs that he was interested in, or did he listen to any music and, you know, when you weren't actually recording and taking no. a break? It was, it was just his material. I, I only found out about uh, the, the Moon Age Daydream solo later. Mm -hmm. I didn't know at the time. Uh, so no, he never, at that particular point in time, he never brought anything in. It was just, we knew what we had to do. Right. We, as such, we, I know for me, I didn't want to be influenced by anything else. Mm -hmm. I was just interested in what we were doing in the studio. And was it a lot easier doing this album, do you think, than Hunky Dory? They were both easy. Mm -hmm. Other than that initial trepidation, once everything started to work, it was easy. We all knew what we were doing. We were having fun, and we were making an album. We were making albums for ourselves. Yeah. And we weren't trying to make records that would sell a lot. It, it was records that we would be pleased with, and just hope that other people would like them. And <laughs> as it turns out, Hunky Dory to start with, people didn't like. Mm -hmm. Then, that all June, changed. No, July. Sixth, wasn't it? I believe. Yeah, 1972. Yes. yes. That's when, uh, after the album comes, well, the album has been out for a couple of weeks, and yep. he does a legendary performance of Starman on top of the pops. It's so many musicians cite as this incredible turning point and an inspirational, uh, amazing, an inspiration to them to actually pursue a career in music or to you know, become the kind of artist that they envisioned becoming, but were maybe afraid because of social conventions. Yeah, and also that whole social conventions thing, it, it, which I don't totally understand, but uh, the, the whole thing of David putting his arm around Rono, was that, that suddenly made a lot of people that felt out of place mm. suddenly feel comfortable with, with their own body. Yeah. And it, it's... They were mates. He put his arm around his mate, but yeah. the, the audience took it a whole di certain parts of the audience took it a whole different way, and it started a huge change. Yeah, and also the you have to say the costume oh, yes. as well. He yes. looked that was you know pretty incredible and shocking, I think, to many people. You know, being beamed into their living rooms. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because that that first costume I don't find that. It was a jump. It was it was like a jumpsuit, but mm -hmm. it was padded. Yeah. As a po it, so. Later on, yeah, they did get a bit outrageous. Like, oh. <laughs> right. But that, 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 when it started, no, it, I, mm -hmm. I was around it, so I, I'm in a strange place to, to judge it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I didn't see it that strange. Well, let's talk about the band members, too, the Spiders from Mars, and starting with Mick Runson, Rano. How important was he both to the recording of Hunky Dory and of, to, for Ziggy Stardust? Oh, he was uh, exceedingly important to David's career. In the early stages, he he was an, a really nice guy. Once again, uh, incredible, talented uh, guitarist, great arranger. He had he always had this thing with his arrangements where he apparently fell asleep the night before he was writing the arrangement, halfway through it, and he'd come in the next morning into the studio uh, about. 10, 15 minutes before the session's due to start, and he'd immediately go running upstairs to the first floor bathroom, <laughs> and he'd lock himself in there. 
And about 15 minutes later, he'd come out with this huge grin on his face with this stack of uh, manuscripts that he would take down and hand out to the orchestra to finish. We never did quite discover why the grin on his face, whether it was <laughs> he finished the manuscript or something else up there. But, uh, and he, he's the one that wrote all those string arrangements yes. that you hear only five years and everything yeah. else. So he was much more than just a guitarist. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Almost absolutely. like a musical director, would you say? <sighs> Yeah, to a point, yes, to a point. But it, it, there was so much, dare I say it, there'd been a musical director before, and that, that was Tony, Tony Visconti, because Tony was the bass player. He, he, along with Rono, he arranged most things, and he, I believe he did the orchestrations on most stuff as well, mm -hmm. most of David's stuff when there was one. So I, I, David, David was the leader. Yeah. But he was a leader that uh, he knew his troops and mm. didn't have to give them explicit orders. Right, absolutely. So he, he was definitely the musical director, but we all followed suit. And how about Woody Woodmansey uh, and on drums? Now, I know he wanted to change a little bit of his style or his sound from Hunky Dory to Ziggy Stardust. Yeah, miserable sorry. <laughs> he decided he didn't like the drum sound on Hunky Dory. <laughs> oh, it sounded like cornflakes packets. <laughs> so when we set up the drums for uh, recording Ziggy Stardust, I told the, the roadie, don't put up the drums. I sent my assistant engineer out to buy as many different sized packets of cornflakes as he could find. <laughs> and we set up a whole drum kit just of Kellogg's cornflakes packets. <laughs> Did you record anything on no. it? <laughs> they sounded too much like real drums. <laughs> <laughs> also on this album, it ain't easy because you said these that the recording of that took place during the Hunky Dory sessions. Correct. That's Rick Wakeman, Rick, isn't it? Yeah, on harpsichord. Yeah, and Dana Gillespie. Yes. Do you want to tell people who Dana Gillespie? Dana, Dana was a, a very close friend of David Nange's. Mm. Uh, she was also managed by Tony Deep Freeze. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> David's manager. And, uh, yeah, and initially when shopping a deal for uh, David right in the beginning, we, they took some tracks from Hunky Dory, they took some tracks by uh, Dana and made up a compilation album to go around record companies to try and do deals for both of them. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look back at this period of this, this early, this first half of this period of recording with, with David Bowie, because of course he did two more albums afterwards, What's how do you how do you frame it this period and what's the kind of what's the lasting impression that you're left with at this point in time? <laughs> I, I just grateful for being a part of it. it yeah, it, it's, it was just an amazing time. Mm -hmm. It really, really was. You know, uh, look, I I was in the center of of this storm that had been going since like the, the the early 60s through to the mid 70s and I was at the center of it for the entire time and just that and it just getting better and better uh, being more involved as it as it went on so it was it was amazing for me mm. absolutely absolutely and it also at that, that period it was uh, within my career it was spreading out there there was David there were then a bit later came Supertramp. Mm -hmm. and th but then there was the whole jazz fusion side that for some reason or another, I was asked to, to start working on and it started off a whole other era, area of my career. It was Amazing. No, it was brilliant. Well, you were also asked to record his last live show as Ziggy Stardust on Correct. the 3rd of July, 1973 at the Hammersmith Odeon. Can you tell us a little bit, did he, did he ask you to record that? Did he say anything special was going to happen that night? Absolutely nothing. It was just another performance. The only special thing was it was being filmed for uh, a doc documentary or just mm -hmm. a, a movie. And so I went down the night before the first show just to watch it to see what was gonna, how it was going to be kind of thing. And then the next night, it, I'm not sure if it's the Rolling Stones mobile truck or, or which one it was. But I wanted to make sure that everything went smoothly from the technical end. And so, as, as well as me, I got Roy Thomas Baker, uh, an engine, another engineer from Trident, that eventually went on to become a successful producer. He produced Queen, uh, The Cars, uh, a whole bunch of others. I can't, Journey, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a whole bunch of others. So he, it was he and I that were recording it. 
and we're going through. First off, the first surprise was Jeff Beck. Mm. We had no idea about that, which was great because I, I knew Jeff. I'd worked with. I did his first album, mm -hmm. and uh, then <sighs> he wasn't going to tour anymore. And just mm. Roy and I just looked at each other and said, "What the fuck?" Because he just announced that just on stage. Completely. Yeah, if, if it even flawed Woody and Trevor, let's face it. They had no idea. Mick did. Oh, did he? Oh, he knew, yeah. He yeah. knew exactly what was going on. Oh, so he knew? Oh, yes. Oh. Oh, that caused a bit of a rift, yes. So <laughs> what happened there? Because there, there was a really big after party just down over Cafe at Royal. Yeah, yeah, Cafe Royal. So the whole band go as yes. well? They all went. Oh, yeah. in, but there must have been such tension not oh, knowing yeah. that they... Or did they think he was joking? <laughs> no one quite knew what... Well... Woody and, and Trevor didn't quite know what was going on. I had no idea. Uh, yeah, it was weird. Yeah. It was weird. And it must have been such a tense time. But then he continues to work with you. Yes. You were kept. Yes. And so it was a, just a brief, you know, you, you briefly you then did pinups and Aladdin Sane. Yeah. And pinups was... Uh, Aladdin, well, Aladdin Sane was... That was before that because that was with Woody, Trevor and... Uh, that was before he quit. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Because we started off in New York. Yeah, it was, that was the original band, uh, except with Mike Garson Mike joining. Garson, yeah. Then there was no more touring. Then it was pinups, and that that was strange because Rono was going to do it because Deep Freeze had said that he's going to make him <laughs> as big a star as David. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> and just to get him to play on the album, and uh, <laughs> there was supposed to be another bass player. Mm -hmm. Ainsley Dunbar was the, the drummer, and there was going to be another bass player who pulled out the last minute. And so David had to go to Trevor and say, uh, we're going to record this album. Would you play for me? Which made it all slightly weird. My gosh, that's... Yeah, it, it was, that was a strange one. It's certainly not my favourite album that I worked on. There are some great tracks on it, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it was weird. My first wife was going to give birth in the middle of it, so I had to fly back to, to England, and I still... Even though I flew back the night before, I still got to the hospital late and, uh, yeah, just everything. Was, <laughs> I got so drunk that night and I was phoning everyone until like four o'clock in the morning. Oh, God, yes, I remember that. Just. <laughs> what is your favourite David Bowie album? As an album, Ziggy. Mm -hmm. I think it holds together as a piece. But. I think there are better tracks on Hunky Dory and on The Lone Scene. Mm, yeah. And maybe one track on I, I Love Sorrow. Yeah, that's a beautiful oh, song. Oh, yeah, so. How about on this album? What's your favourite song on this album? It changes. Mm -hmm. It changes. I, I've been listening to it a lot lately because of the, the 50th anniversary and everything. And it, it, it was for a long time. It, it was uh, Moon Age Daydream. Mm hmm Recently, it's been five years now. Then it changed to rock and roll suicide. And the, the, my least favorite, mm -hmm. be, just because I've heard it so damn much, those blaring baritone saxes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> suffragette. I don't care if I never hear that damn song again. <laughs> so you'll be sitting in the green room when the album <laughs> plays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, thank you. Anything else you'd like to share with us about the recording? We are going to have a Q&A after the album, album plays. But is there anything else you'd like to share no, I with us? I can off the top of my head, I think. I think we've gone through everything. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Ken. Would you give Ken You're a welcome. round of applause? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, so with this album, David Bowie had ended up turning a very popular art form, pop music, into high performance art. And he really lived and breathed the character of his own construction until it really nearly consumed him. But Ziggy Stardust inspired and continues to inspire people to enact their own vision of who they want to be and how they want to live their lives, irrespective of social conventions. Of course, the icon started to take over its creator's own personal identity, and Bowie became more and more consumed by Ziggy, and he realized he'd eventually have to kill him off. He later said at that time, Everybody was convincing me that I was the Messiah, especially on that first American tour. I got hopelessly lost in the fantasy. 
Of course, Ziggy eventually succumbs to rock and roll suicide, and David Bowie was free to then pursue and create other personas, and more importantly, an amazing, amazingly significant body of work. But in another sense, Ziggy didn't die because he's locked into the grooves of this album, which we're about to listen to. So again, I'm just going to remind you to please turn your phones off, refrain from conversation, and let's listen to the entire album of the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. This is where I depart. <laughs> I'll see you Thank you. Well, that was wonderful. Haven't, uh, it was just lovely. Thanks for all for listening as well. Thank you very much for, to all oh, of you. Thank you. So now it's the fun part in the evening for Ken and I, because you get to ask the questions. So we have a roving microphone. We have two mics. Who would who would like to go first? This gentleman right here in the middle. There's a microphone. Where is the microphone? Who who has the microphones? Over there. Okay. This somewhere right here. Well, good evening, and first of all, thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure. As you can tell, it means a lot to, uh, to us. I'd like to ask, you mentioned that uh, David Bowie and Mick Ronson came to your house with some cassette demos. No, I didn't say Mick Ronson. All oh, right, Did David we, Bowie came with. D David, Angie, and Bob Grace is publishing. Right, yeah. and they came with some cassette demos of the songs that went on to the album. Uh, can you think of an example where you added some suggestions or ideas between what happened from that cassette demo that you heard and what we heard on the final record? And a couple of quick supplementaries. How many tracks were there at Trident? And did you keep any memorabilia or souvenirs from the session? <laughs> <laughs> the hot pounce? Let's go through. <laughs> I don't, rem I don't even remember what demos we went through. And uh, the demos were of Hunky Dory, they weren't of Ziggy. We just went straight in and did Ziggy. So there, there were, other than what we had done with, with uh, Arnold Corns, uh, that was the only way I got to hear the songs before we went into the studio. Uh, and David didn't play demos, he just would go through a song for the, for the guys and they'd learn it from that. Uh, then there was... What was the second one? Number of oh, number of tracks was 16. Uh, yeah. And memorabilia, the... This. After we had done Aladdin Sane, uh, I was over at David's place, and he got down on one knee and <laughs> gave me this. Everyone was terrified he was going to ask me to marry him. But... <laughs> I knew he was already married, so I knew it couldn't be that. <laughs> but there, there, it, it's in, there's an inscription on the inside. It, it's uh, DB, the lightning flash, and KS. And I've worn it almost every day since he gave it to me. <laughs> Gentlemen, right here. That's okay, you can... Okay. <laughs> we'll catch both of you. Pardon? Okay. I have never... Um, I've never seen you before, Ken, but I no. have read your name on the album. I'm one of these people, like a sort of an anorak who sits with the record. And but everyone used to be like that. Oh, no, it's, it's we were all so like that back in the day. It's, it's a great... Not... It's a great pleasure to see you, you know. Uh, I, like many people in this room, probably know every single word on that album, looking around during the, the performance of it. But I just wanted to ask you, have you ever basked in the glory of being Ken Scott? When, you were, <laughs> <laughs> when, when people come round to your house, uh, do you have Hard Day's Night people and Ziggy Stardust people who come round? <laughs> and if so, which do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> I j just with, with Bast in the Glory, no. Uh, I, I did. I lived in Los Angeles for many, many years, and 
towards the end of that, that time, I was finding it hard to, to get work. And I decided what I should do is put together a sh like actors do, put together a show reel of, of what I'd done. It finished up being, it was only one track off of various albums I'd done. It finished up being three CDs. <laughs> and I could not, I, I'm sitting there putting it together and I did this. Fuck. <laughs> it, it just uh, every, it keep on going through. And it, that's the closest I think I've come to basking in the glory. But it, it, it's because, as I said, I, I find it, I do find it very hard to take in all, all of this because I made records for myself. So I, it, it, it was very greedy. I'm, I, it, it's all for me. And so to, to get this kind of thing, uh, what, what you give out, I find it very hard to accept because it just feels hypocritical somehow because I didn't do it for you. I did it for me. <laughs> so you can all disappear. <laughs> now, thank you for liking it and buying it. <laughs> that gentleman right there. Um, again, thank you very much, uh, Ken, My for pleasure. what's been such a wonderful evening. Um, I'm sorry, I must say I'm, I'm both of those most terrible of things, both a journalist and a historian. Um, so my question is sort of framed in both those contexts. Um, but as somebody who's a sort of relatively young, um, apologies to the rest of the audience, um, uh, very, very fan. Um, my, my question is, um, you mentioned at points such as, you know, David considering how this is going to sell in America, et cetera, et cetera. And I think especially for my generation, um, the impression of Bowie we get is that he's the great liberator, he's the great free thinker, et cetera. He is the figure who sort of changed society in a way that nobody else could, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but from your sort of personal experience of him and from your wider observations, et cetera, to what extent in David Bowie's mind were balanced the commercial side, the need to sell records, and David Bowie as poet, artist, etc., all the rest, and David Bowie as we know him today? To what extent is, I guess, that legend undermined by David as the man who wants to be famous? Uh, there are two acts I've worked with that what impressed me so much about them was... Uh, their heroism, their bravery. That's the Beatles and that's Bowie. And the, the reason that I say the bravery is they, like most acts do, they changed every album. They weren't out to make the same album again and again and just try and keep that small group of fans. We've got to keep doing the same to please them. Uh, it's... If they don't like it, it's fine. These people will like it. If they don't like it, these people will like it. And they were constantly changing. And that takes guts. It really does. Because you've got all of the people around you, the, the staff, the, the tour, tour people, management, agents, all of these people are living off of you, basically. And to be able to turn around and just, I don't care if I don't sell another record. It's, this is what I want to do. It takes a lot, a lot of guts. And both the Beatles and David had that. The fact that David said at one point that his least favourite record was Let's Dance, which happened to be his biggest seller, I think shows where his head was more at. It was the artistic statement and what pleased him more than the, the selling of records. Did that answer it? Yes. Okay, good. John, do we have a question from the online audience? Um, yeah, we've got a couple of good ones here. Um, oh, we don't want good ones. Well, all right, here's a, <laughs> I'll, give you a, I'll give you an average one then. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you play any, uh, this is from Mick, and do you appear on any of the other albums apart from uh, the, end, uh, the start of Andy Warhol? Do you play anything? No. I'm, I'm, I'm not a musician. I have a musician's soul. Uh, I can play a few chords on guitar. Uh, the, 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 my biggest appearance on a record, I played the solo on Daniel, Elton John's Daniel. I played the, the, uh, <laughs> the ARP solo on it, which was basically recreate, just playing what David Johnson had already played on mandolin, but I still see money for it every six well, months, so I'm not going to knock it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> 
Do you want to ask another one while we have you? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so here's a question from Graham. This is a question about the vibe between David and Mick Ronson. Um, and what was the vibe between the chemistry between them? And uh, did you feel you were in the presence of greatness? Or was it more mundane and ordinary than we might imagine? No, I, th I think it was them felt that they were in the presence of greatness. <laughs> At least they should have done. <laughs> uh, look, we were all bud buddies. It was, it were, it... They were great friends. That, that they... Yeah, they, they had a great relationship for as long as it lasted. Uh, and... When it was over, it was over. There, 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 I know for a while there was some resentment there, but uh, I think it got sorted out towards the end. Uh, I'm not sure. But no, uh, during that time, we were all good friends. And uh, there was no, we were in presence of greatness or anything like that. We were just buddies. Now, there's someone right there, if you want to hand your microphone. Oh, yeah. And then there's... a. Uh, People in the back, if you don't mind bringing oh, yeah. the microphone to the back. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> to the back. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks again, Ken, for sharing your stories with us tonight. That's uh, been wonderful so far. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us anything about the sequencing of the tracks on the album, because I always thought five years opening the album was very brave and unusual, that sort of track. And I wondered if David had a very clear idea of the track listing or whether you had any influence or input on that. You know, I've, I've been asked about track running orders uh, several times and I honestly can't remember much about it. Oh. I know that during that, oh, that period, whether I was just the engineer or whether I was producer, as we were recording the tracks, I, I would take the timings and, and work out, OK, we can have this because we, we could only have like maximum 24 minutes per side otherwise the volume starts to come down so it was trying to match up and you wanted to really have the same amount of time on each side you didn't want one 24 and the other one 12. Uh, so i was constantly going through okay this song's going to end there so that's two minutes 32 and then this one working out what would work in different orders kind of thing how we came up with the final running order i have no idea I can't remember if I was told that's what it was going to be, whether we worked on it together or I just threw a bunch of songs together. <laughs> the one thing that I do know that I was very conscious of in, doing, in putting it together, when I worked at Abbey Road as an assistant engineer or button pusher as we used to be called, when we weren't on sessions, one of the things we had to do was we'd get tapes of American albums come in. And we had to put exactly five seconds of leader in between each title. There had to be exactly five seconds. And from the, from the get-go, I thought, well, the five seconds works after this one, but this one, it should be sh much shorter. And it was that kind of thing. So when it came to putting the album together, I purposely kept everything, almost everything. There was, I think, one occasion, maybe two, where I felt it should be slightly longer. But I put it all on the beat so that even if the tempo changed, you'd be tapping your foot and then the, you'd hit the first beat of the next song. I think that the, the, you get that very much from uh, five years into, uh, into Soul Love. Uh, it, it, and I tried to do that all the way through. So that was very much me putting it together in the end. Coming up with the running order. Hmm. Well, some you of the songs recall, segue. But as you say, it hangs together very well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And some it of the worked. songs segue together as well. Sorry? Some of the songs actually segue into yeah, the next yes. song. Yeah, as, as such. Oh, yeah. Interesting. There's people back there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, just a quick question. Um, do you um, see any uh, echoes of um, Ziggy in uh, a lot of Davies' later work at all? Do you like listen to it and think, oh, yes, I was, hear myself and my input into that? Do you see any of that at all? If I did, I tended not to listen any further. <laughs> it, it, it's, I don't listen to much music these days because so much of it is a rehash of what I've... Look, I've been in the music business for 60 years now. Uh, sorry, 59. And uh, <laughs> oh, 60 would make me so old. <laughs> so uh, I've heard it all, uh, mostly. And so it, it, between having heard it before and auto-tune, I find it very hard to listen to records these days. And with, with 
<laughs> oh, don't get me started. <laughs> I'd do a whole 15 minutes, a half an hour bitch mm -hmm. session at the end of my talks normally, <laughs> and I let rip. So <laughs> uh, I don't think we've got time for that today. But uh, where was I? That's the trouble with old age. You lose track, don't you? Yeah, I know. If, uh, yeah, so it, it, it's... With, with David, if I got an inkling that, oh, that's him trying to recreate life on Mars, then it's, I'm not interested, I'll move off kind of thing. So I, I know that there were times when I did feel, oh, yeah, that's, whether it was trying to, to do the same thing or it was just happening because you do tend to repeat yourself eventually, I don't know, but I, I would zone out if I heard that. Hi, uh, Hi, Peter. Um, first of all, it's a huge privilege and an honor to be in your presence, and thank you so much. For, for me, too. Contributed really to too. Our, our happiness. Um, I just wanted to ask you two questions. One was, could you just walk us through how a masterpiece like Suffragette City was created? Why that one? What? <laughs> you know, David comes in, he's got the chords, he's got the lyrics, he's got the singing, and then he gets together with these other people, and he creates something that's so perfect and so wonderful and so intense, how does that magic happen? And the, I've got a little supplementary, which is a bit cheeky, but Ringo plays on a hard day's night something on a three second grab, and an old chap says, don't play that. What's that piece of music, if you can remember? <laughs> don't remember that at all. But how, how did it happen? It, it, it did. It, 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 <laughs> How does magic ever happen? There's, there's no way of, of, of putting it out there. It's just we were in the studio, we knew what we had to do, and we did it. That, that, that was it. Uh, of course, it didn't really take off until the blaring baritone saxes. That's when it became a masterpiece. But uh, no, it, 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 I can't. Did David tell the guys what to do? No. It was. It was very much, he'd show the song and he had us all working on it because he knew what we would bring to it. And that's what we all did. We brought what, what, we, knew, what we knew was needed to it. Now, I've heard from other musicians talking about David from, much, from later periods where they, they say, I think Carl, uh, Carlos Alomar has said it many times that David would come in, play the song and then say, okay, do what you want. Because he put those musicians there because he knew what they could bring to it. With Garson, uh, I was telling someone in the audience earlier, outside, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't to blame. I, I, I kept him out there, okay? Uh, with Mike Garson uh, playing on the, the track of that insane, uh, David brought him in because of the avant-garde side of... of Garson's playing, but Garson didn't realise that. And he went through several times of, of the piano solo, and he, I think he went through a salsa version, he went through an, uh, all different kinds, but much, much more normal. And David kept on saying, no, I want you to do what you do normally. And he said, you want it? You got it. And he played that amazing solo. Mm -hmm. David brought him in precisely because of that. But... Garson didn't realise it, whereas with us, we were there from the beginning, so we knew he's got us here because he knows what we can do. He never spoke to me about what, what he wanted sound-wise or anything like that. He didn't come along to... He came along to one... Two mixes during the entire time I worked with him. He came along to... Uh, what was it? <laughs> yeah, I know I did. Now I can't damn well remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, 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 the love song on The Lad Insane. Uh, Lady Grinning Soul. Lady Grinning Soul, thank you, yes. He yes, came... the Mike Garson piano solo. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. yeah, I know. He came along to that one, so it must have been a very, very personal song to him. And he came along, the last, no, not the last thing I did with David, the last thing I did with him was the 1980 Floor Show. But just before that, we recorded uh, a track which eventually got re-recorded and split up for Diamond Dogs. It, it was Dodo, uh, 1984 Dodo. And 
he came along to that mix and when we were doing it, he kept on playing albums or bits of albums that were Philadelphia mm. sound, like Barry White and that kind of thing. He said, I want it to sound like that. I want it to sound like that. He went on to that, an album later. American. The American, yeah. But he had to, we couldn't give it to him. He had to put together the team, the Americans. Yep. They knew how to do it. So he put that team together and did it. That's what he was brilliant at. And he didn't have to show them what to do. He just played them the songs and they did what came naturally. The same was with us. This person right there. Uh, once again, like everybody else, Ken, thank you so much for the music. Um, and thanks, yeah. Colleen, as well, for the evening. It's absolutely it's such a pleasure. Um, if it's all right, can I be greedy? A couple of questions. Uh, <gasps> first, first of all, Ken, um, in terms of the technical mixing aspects of the album, um, there's certain things of, you know, b background vocals being like really in the distance with reverb on them and certain echoes and certain other reverbs that are there. How much of that is you and how much, how much input did David have into the mixing? Was it 100% you? <laughs> Brilliant, that's an easy one. Okay, that's very easy. Because um, it, it's just, to, to listen to it through the, the 800s is just, it's such a stunning experience to, to experience that. Um, and second question is, out of all the albums that you didn't produce and mix, which one would you have liked to have? Oh, produced? God knows. <laughs> I, 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 that that's, one I can't That's my answer question, at all. and that's David Bowie albums, not all albums, just David Bowie. Yeah, no, go, go. Yeah, I, I did understand that. <laughs> uh, no, I... Uh, the album I would have loved to have done with David was never recorded. And what I, both David and I were bad parents. Uh, we were workaholics. We were too busy. He, was, he wasn't particularly a good father for, for Duncan, and I wasn't a particularly good father for, for my twins, uh, Laurie and Kim. And I always loved Kooks, which was written specifically for Duncan. And I, I, it, people said, would you ever work with David again? And... This was much later, of course, uh, and uh, I'd always say, yeah, but what I'd like to do, we've both grown, we've both experienced how we were bad in the past. I'd love to do a kid's album with him, like Kooks, just a whole album of that. That's the album I would have liked to have done with him. But, uh, yeah. And the other thing, just with regard to, to the reverb you said, a great example of my use of reverb was on uh, Walk on the Wild Side. The, the, the coloured girls, do 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 I got so bored with hearing do 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 do, -do. <laughs> I wanted to do something differently, so what I, I just set it up to try, uh, to try and emulate the girls walking forward as they sing it. And the way I did it, I just set the reverb when they're some way away, and then just gradually made them louder without the reverb getting louder. And to me, it, it sounds as if they're walking forward which was what I tried to do. So hopefully you'll go home, you'll put on that record, listen to it. <laughs> oh, yeah, he did it, right. <laughs> Someone right next to you, their hand up right there, the cap on. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Hi. Um, if you're a musician, you spend a lot of time listening to how about um, musicians speaking about how different producers um, c get different things. Yeah. So um, this is really weird because we're discussing iconic music and you're the iconographer, as it were, including the other guy who's not present, unfortunately. <laughs> um, could you talk us through how you um, get a quality, satisfactory hand clap? Oh, God. <laughs> 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 I have never recorded a good hand clap in my life. <laughs> I hate recording them. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't. They're, they're just so percussive. I've never got a good one as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it is difficult. That person right there? Uh, someone over there too, yeah. Got you. Hi, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> hi, Colleen. Hi. Um, what do you think the most important takeaway for a young creative would be looking at David Bowie as a young creative and how he operated and who he was. 
do your own thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, I tell my students that uh, don't try and make records for other people because you'll, you'll finish up probably falling down at doing it. There are very, very few people that have the ability to make records purely for people to buy, not necessarily ones that they feel. So I, I think Stop Waterman and mm. whatever it was, they were very good at, at just creating uh, a hit record that they didn't necessarily <laughs> feel. <laughs> 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 that they didn't necessarily feel anything for. Uh, at, at least, if you if you make something that you're happy with, if your if your career within the music industry doesn't happen, you'll be able to look back on it and say, at least I made something for me. I, I made something that I'm happy. I was happy with, I am happy with. Because if you try and do it for someone else and then it doesn't happen, it's very much why, why did I do it kind of thing. If you're making it for yourself, you know why you're making it. It's because you need to put that piece of music out there you know, in a way that pleases you. Thank you so much. Okay. So a gentleman waiting patiently over here, right over there. Hi, Kev. Brilliant you. night. Um, just one question. Do you think it would be possible to get that energy that you've got in the modern digital studio where ed everything's edited and you have all the effects on the oh. and all this other Because, oh. I mean, I, I, I run a studio and you just listen to these old recordings and there's such an intensity there. And I just don't think you have that in modern recordings. To the you're, you're pushing me to a bitch session, aren't you? <laughs> Do you really want that? Yeah. Now, of course you can. It's we as human beings that can't. And, and uh, what I mean is, we had to make decisions back in the day. We, we had to work fast. Uh, first off, we had two weeks to make a record, so we, we had to move fast. We only had 16 tracks, so we couldn't record 22 sax, blaring sax solos. Uh, and just make, leave the decision to someone else to make later, which is going to be. We had to make the decision then and there. And it just moved along like this. These days, it's what, three years between albums? It's, uh, you have 199 tracks and no one wants to make a decision. And the worst thing that I'm getting caught up on, because I've been doing some stuff, I can't say what it was, but I've been doing some stuff, uh, mixing at home in the box and I always tell my, my students that go for the first mix. It, 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 we, it used to be a performance that a bunch of us would take care of on the desk. I'd be looking after something, the producer would be looking after something, the, the guitarist would be looking after something, everyone would be taking care of something, and we all had to perform that mix. These days it's all automated, and I, I say just go for the first thing and then that's it, put it away. I have fallen foul of what you can do. I'm now going th in three days later and putting up half a dB in that hi-hat in the third chorus because I think it really makes a difference. I'm stupid. I'm a human. <laughs> I'm doing what every human does. If we can change it, we will. And it, it, when we, the, the limitations make it so great. It's because we can't spend lots of time because we have to make decisions that we got those records that we did back then. Now, it's auto-tuned to death. It, I, I lived in Nashville for two years and they have some absolutely amazing musicians there. And even those session musicians weren't giving their best because they were so fed up with, at the end of the, the, them playing something, they would hear, okay guys, we've got enough to cut and paste it together, thanks. Why do you bother giving your best if you're gonna get we can cut and paste it together, thanks. You don't bother. That's where we're at. People don't have to give that performance at that time. It can all be cut and pasted and auto-tuned and moved around, so they don't bother. That's where we stand. I'm sorry, folks. But, uh, <laughs> Let's try to answer and, the and, positive question. <laughs> and, and, and then, let's, let's face it, the, the other thing, with streaming, musicians aren't getting paid these days, except for a very 
the 1%. 0.006 to 0.008 yeah. pence per stream. Yes. It's obscene. Yeah. It's absolutely obscene. And unless that's changed, I, 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 I'm getting into my bitch and I shouldn't be. <laughs> I, I will not stream anything. I, I pay for Amazon Prime just to get the things quickly. I will, I, that gives me, that entitles me to use their streaming system. I won't. I won't be the hypocrite that will bitch about streaming because of the payment and then listen to it. I, I mm. refuse. Mm. It, it, it's... Uh, that's yeah. no, enough. Let's have another <laughs> question, please. <laughs> a, a, we, have <laughs> we have time for one more. The gentleman ha raising his hand right there, please. And then can we have one more from the internet? No? No more? The interweb. Hi there. Uh, thanks for a great evening, like everyone else has said. And I want to reverse that to a more positive aspect. <laughs> it was Good great luck. listening to that record on these speakers with that setup. And if you're looking for a home for it afterwards, I can. <laughs> 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 on that note, technology has massively advanced in the last 50 years. And the way that we make music has improved as well as, you know, deteriorated. And with the various reissues, remixes, I'm sure you've got some examples of the, the most I horrendous reissues that have happened with horrendous compression, et cetera, et cetera. I would love to hear an example where you have perhaps heard something that's been reissued, redone, um, thought about it in a different way, where you've thought, wow, I wish I'd been able to do that at the time. <coughs> I'm, I might get blasted for this. <laughs> Because this is something I was involved in, and uh, it, it, I asked to have my name taken off it, and it's this album. Mm. Uh, I did uh, 5.1 surround sound mixes, 2000, something like that, 1999, 2000, around that, that period. And I, I loved it. I, I thought that the whole surround sound thing, it was great. You could do things that you couldn't with just straight stereo. The, the record company or someone connected with the record company, maybe David's management or whatever, wanted something new out there. We, we couldn't do another reissue of a remaster or something like that. We've got to get something new. So what they did, they took the 5.1 and they put it down into stereo and it sounded shit. I hated it. It was awful. So that to me is... is the worst example because it's something that I did that I enjoyed when I did it and then it got used mm. badly as far as I was concerned but that hasn't happened nothing like that has happened since luckily so has mm. there been any anyone that you've worked on subsequently where you felt you were able to improve I can't talk about that mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll leave that one there then. yeah <laughs> All right, well, I think we've gone a bit over the time here, so thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Bowers and Wilkins for bringing these wonderful 800 series uh, speakers. It's, it's, thank you so much. It's wonderful to listen to the album on, on these loudspeakers. I want to thank the British Library for having us back. It's always a pleasure to do, host our Classic Album Sundays events here. Of course, I want to thank Ken Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank all of you for coming along and for listening. It's been a real pleasure to listen to this album together, all seated together in a room, listening to one of our, uh, such an amazing album celebrating its 50th anniversary. So thanks to all of you. Thank you for listening. Okay. <laughs>